There were plenty of indications that fire was a distinct possibility, a drier than average preceding three years, no effective rainfall since June meant that we were in drought, our creek had stopped flowing four weeks earlier, abnormally hot, 43 degrees C, a new maximum for us, and more than enough wind to dry the landscape. The national parks that surround us had not had general fire in them for the 37 years that we had lived here. A fire nearby and another south of Eden gave us an eerie orange sky for several days and a thick smoky haze following that. No stars for over three weeks and sunrises and sets were brilliantly orange or red. A grey ash covered all surfaces. Lightning from thunderstorms ignited fires on the coastal range, including one at nearby Big Jack Mountain to the northeast of us, but some distance off. A friend living near there had emailed us, having watched it advancing towards him at speed the Friday evening and night before. Nature called on me a couple of times that night, and a yellow glow could be seen to the northwest accompanied by a constant roar, like continuous thunder. It was on the way. By 11 the next morning, fire had spotted to a ridge to the northwest of us and on the side of a hill below the Wyndham Trig. then to a lower one. Spot fires ignited on neighbouring properties all around us. One of these was in a paddock of ours just over the creek from the village of Wyndham where RFS attended and extinguished it. But the fire had different ideas and a short time later with a blustery oven hot wind change from the southeast it was reignited and raced up our hill in the opposite direction from which it had advanced from earlier in the day. Joining the first fire front and moving off towards Devil's Hole. It did this in a manner best described as being spectacularly explosive.
Sleep did not come e easily or quickly that night. The scene from our window was of twinkling red lights. The stillness shattered with the ongoing thunder and echo of falling trees, finally yielding to the flames. You don't realise how lucky we were till you look around after the event. Every square metre of ground has several pieces of charred leaves, bark and twigs scattered around. While patrolling our house and sheds for the five or six hours, we were peppered by them continuously, some still warm when handled. It only takes one of these, still alight, to land in the right place and with a puff of wind, a spot fire can start. I was shaken to find some of these had blown into a shed, landing only centimetres from hay. While we kept an eye around the sheds, the insides were largely ignored. Fire is a fickle thing, with a largely unpredictable mind of its own. We were lucky. Our buildings, livestock are all OK. Although we did lose fencing and dry pasture feed. In these circumstances, however, one person's good luck can be somebody else's bad luck, and other people had a horrid time fighting off fire, and some lost houses, sheds, and of course their contents. This is what the burnt country around our place looked like the next day, still smoky, and of course eerily quiet except for the occasional falling tree. It is not a pleasant experience to watch your country burn, as part of you burns with it. While the wind changed moved the fire away from our place, they continued to burn the surrounding bush, attracting the attention of firefighters. later a drop of rain. A fair bit in fact, over four days. The resulting floodwaters were ash grey in colour. The abruptness of this change in conditions put some of the locals out too and left a deposit of black sticky smelly goo after the water had receded another week on and the transformation is nothing short of remarkable It seems that some sort of tranquillity has descended on our place, but after the emotional ride from drought through fire, then flood, over a fortnight, has me glancing over my shoulder on the lookout for whatever is coming next. <laughs>